I don't believe flying is for everybody. I believe most people are trainable. Mm-hmm. And I have witnessed in my career certain people somehow they get a PPL private pilot license. But unfortunately, there's a difference between the actual flying of an airplane and then what we call the human skills of flying. Mm-hmm. So that is one of my passions. I recently became recertified as a CRM instructor and CRM trainer, which means I can now teach young pilots, new pilots, old pilots in crew resource management. Hi Nick, how are you? I'm very well, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you. Oh, it's so lovely to meet you here on Zoom. Likewise, yes. Thank you for having me on your channel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, wanting to talk about the art of aviation because I think it's something that we don't think about as much as, uh, you know, as when we fly. We just think of a holiday and we think of where we're going, but we don't really always understand what it's all about. You guys sitting there in the cockpit, you know? Yeah, that's very true, hey? Behind the scenes work that goes into any trip is quite something. Yeah, yeah. Now I know, and I, um, when I did this project uh, here in Vienna and I photographed artists in their windows, I also photographed a few pilots in their windows, a few young pilots of Austrian Air. And I then it made me really think about this, you know, and, and how passionate they are and how dedicated they are. And I think I could really draw lines to uh, to the artist, you know, to, to the guy who plays the piano. And and I was thinking about this always, you know, that how how really art is connected in many ways, uh, in many fields that we that we experience every day. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Going back to the passion side of things, I think anyone who has a passion for what they do is, in my opinion, in the right job or in the right field. Um, to be honest, I've never really thought of flying as an art until I watched a couple of your, your videos, especially the one you did with the, um, his name escapes me right now, the aerobatic pilot. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Patrick, Patrick Davidson. Patrick, that's a job, Patrick Davidson. So I think it's fantastic in the sense that, you know, uh, aerobatics is definitely an art. Uh, my brother's just done his aerobatic license in the UK. So I've been fortunate enough to understand a lot more about aerobatics. Um, but I agree. I think anything you have a passion for, and my passion started very young in life, um, you, you never look back. I did take a break from aviation for four years just to further my studies in uh, human behavior and human performance. Uh, I've always had this, I suppose, niggling question at the back of the mind as to why we're here. What is this all about? Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I love learning from others. I love teaching others. I love inspiring others. I love to be inspired. So yeah. it's, um, it's true. <laughs> we do have an art, actually. You, you're very right. Yeah. It's an art and a passion. Yeah, definitely. But I first now want to know uh, where, where this, did this love of aviation start for you? Um, it started at a very young age. So oh. I was born in uh, what was Rhodesia at the time. And I grew up mm-hmm. in Harare, which was Salisbury at the time. And where we lived was on the flight path between the light aircraft airport Charles Prince and Harare Airport. And it was also to a degree on the flight path with planes taking off and leaving Harare Airport or Salisbury Airport at the time. So I just, you know, whenever a plane flew over, I ran outside and I was looking up at the sky and, uh, you know, just thinking maybe one day, maybe one day. And then I about the age of five years old, my brother and my dad and I went on a trip to Big Falls for the day. And that was the first time I went on an aeroplane and I loved it. I loved every minute of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my brother and I fought over who was going to sit by the window. Because, okay. you know, if you're not sitting by the window, you're not looking out, then you're wasting your time flying, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and from, yeah, from there, it just sort of grew. Unfortunately, back in, in, in the 80s, we didn't have internet. And I did some research on a career guidance book that my brother had about becoming a pilot. And really the only way was either the military, which wasn't going to be an option, or you had to be very bright. Now, 
my parents wouldn't enjoy this, but they know the story. I went to school for socializing and for um, to play sport. Those were okay. my two passions, <laughs> to socialize and to play sport. So uh, as my brother told my parents after my what would have been my matric year, which I failed dismally, um, you know, you're just staying for your, for your son to go to a very expensive sports club. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that's where the passion came along. Um, at the age of 16, a friend of mine took up flying and he was doing it privately. Now, I had no idea you could do that. You know, you pay for your own flying, you pay for your license. And one thing leads to another, you get a commercial pilot's license and then hopefully get a job. Unfortunately, my family wasn't that uh, well off. So mm -hmm. I had to look at options. Um, I left school at the age of 17 and uh, went for a medical. And unfortunately I had what is known as white coat hypertension. So it was a tough blow, but it was because aviation medicine wasn't that advanced back in the eighties. So, you know, I ended up up on 24 blood pressure monitors I've ended up on 24 ECG monitors and there's absolutely nothing wrong with me it's just as the one doctor explained it's it's an exam excitement so you get a little bit nervous going for uh, your medical yeah. and my blood pressure was up so I have a doctor back in Zim who very kindly told me to my face at the age of 17 you will never be a pilot what so, really yeah because of my because of my my supposed um, high blood pressure, so actually at the time I was very annoyed, but it actually inspired me because I thought, you know what, I'll prove you wrong, and here I am sitting with just over eight thousand hours of total time. Um, Amazing. I, start, I started a generation after my generation, so I've been very fortunate in the mentors I've had, and that's really what's got me where I am today is the people who've mentored me. Mm. So, what at what age then did you did you start your training? Um, back in 1995, so I was just uh, 24 years old. Um, started flying in February 95. I got my PPL in August 95, mm -hmm. and then I was out of funds. Actually, to finish my PPL, I had to borrow money from my brother. So. Uh -huh. You know, I was very fortunate in that sense that he had his own business. He was willing to sponsor me. And then it was just a case of taking friends to Victoria Falls or flying them off to Kariba or, you know, get one chipping in and building the hours uh, until I had enough money. In 1997, I went to the U.S. and did my commercial pilot's license. Okay. Yeah, but this is, so you had to pay privately initially for, for this, yeah. Because this is something that... Um, uh, it's also a factor that you think, you know, it's a very expensive training if you have to pay for yourself. And I wonder how many people, and, and like you say now with you, you had this absolute drive, you just decided, well, I'm going to prove you wrong. But I wonder how many people slip through the net just because somebody had said, oh, you have to be this or you, you, you can't be a pilot because of this. And, and then they just don't pursue it. Uh, Petra, you know, that's a great observation. And, you know, I was actually chatting to my next door neighbor the other day. We we're talking about, you know, people driven by their dreams. So I can give you two different scenarios. I have done quite a bit of public speaking here in South Africa, um, you know, when I was involved in the personal development world. And a young gentleman approached me and said, Oh, I'd do anything to be a pilot. And most pilots, anybody who watches this, and I'm sure it's not only pilots, maybe pianists or um, artists, oh, I'd do anything to be an artist. Okay, great. You know, what are you willing to do really at the end of the day? And yeah. I said to him, no problem. Listen, why don't you come to Grand Central? I know a flying school there. Maybe we can get you involved. Maybe we can find a way for you to follow your passion. Mm -hmm. um, and he very luckily got sponsored. And I think he lasted three months. And that was a dropped, fell away, never to be heard of again. And I thought, wow, that's a, a sad thing because really, if it was your dream, yeah, you should have, could have, would have done anything to make it work. Mm -hmm. I then had another young gentleman who I ended up, I actually paid for his pilot's license. And the reason being is he wrote to one of the flying magazines here in South Africa 
and he said, you know, my family's fallen on hard times. I've had to leave university. I'm doing odd jobs here and there. My passion is to fly. Please, anybody can help. I'll wash airplanes. I'll sweep hangar floors. So I thought, okay, again, I've heard this all before. So I contacted the young gentleman and I said, listen, my advice based on what happened in my life and my experience is go and get a medical. Just get yourself a class two medical in South Africa and then let's talk from there. The very next afternoon, I had a WhatsApp message with a picture of his medical. Mm -hmm. He had done it. I thought, okay, wow, this guy's serious. So I said, okay, why don't you come to Grand Central on Saturday and let's meet at 10 o'clock and let's discuss possibly your options. Now, not knowing at the time this young gentleman worked or lived in Rustenburg, which is about a good hour and a half drive from Grand Central. And he arrived at quarter to 10 and sent me a message. He said, I'm here with my dad. Where would you like to meet? So we sat in the Harvard Cafe at Grand Central. I asked him a few questions, gauged how his reactions were. And I thought, okay, let me ask the owner of the flying school that I'm at if he has any positions for you. Fortunately, Ian had a position for him, gave him a job behind the desk. Um, I asked one of the instructors to take him up and just see if he actually has the possibility or the capability, I should say, of being able to fly. And yeah, one thing led to another and I ended up sponsoring him for his VPL. Um, and he's wow. still involved in the game now. He still works uh, in aviation. He's studied for his commercial license. He's building his hours. So I'm hoping in the next couple of months he will get his commercial license. And mm -hmm. yeah, join us in the in the profession. That's amazing. And and yeah. because it also takes time. It's not something that you can just in, in three months or in a year do. You have to really dedicate your time to the hours that you have to fly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a dedication, but I suppose it's as with anything. If, if you put the time in, you get the reward out. Um, at the moment, I'm studying for my instructor rating. So at the ripe old age of 50, I'm trying to become a, an instructor, which some people think is crazy, but this is my way of now getting back to the industry. Um, you know, I've joined a, a group here in South Africa that's going to look at how we can maybe transform the way we train pilots. And there's a lot of great companies, great pilots involved in the group. We're going to work closely with the Civil Aviation Authority. It will take time. You know, these things don't happen overnight. Um, but like anything, it's a dedication. And, you know, what you put in is what you're going to get out. That I definitely, definitely uh, swear by. Yeah. Well, I saw a, a very interesting documentary about South African airways and, and the history of flying in South Africa. And it, it, it was an old documentary, but it was so insightful. And I never really knew how South Africa was actually also had groundbreaking um, things happening very, very early on. I think it is something like six years after uh, the Wright brothers flew the first, uh, the, or the Kitty Hawk, a South African, there were South Africans who were also flying, who also built a little matchbox that they call, I think it was a matchbox or something okay. like that they call it. Right. And then um, in, 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 in 1911 already, there was a, somebody registering an airline and you think this, uh, you, you don't uh, think that of, of South Africa, you know, you think it was, uh, it was happening in America or, but in South Africa also, you know, things were happening. I, I think in the industry here in South Africa, we've got some amazing people. Um, my father-in-law is ex-South African Airways um, and he retired in 2003, but has been involved in aviation ever since he retired. He has given up his license and is just, you know, flying with friends over weekends and things like that. I was very fortunate just before South African Airways went, uh, let's say, under, because now we have South African Airways 2.0. But a couple of years ago, I was very fortunate. I'm well connected with the, he was head of human factors at South African Airways. So he was involved in the CRM training of the pilots and he managed to get myself and my co-pilot into one of the simulated training sessions just to see how they train. Now, having worked for Cathay Pacific, having seen training sessions at other airlines around the world, I can honestly say I was shocked by how professional. Now, I shouldn't say I, I was shocked because why would I be shocked? Yeah. The professionalism was one level and it's just 
is testament to the people who have put in so much effort in, in the industry in this country as to how well advanced South African aviation actually is. Mm-hmm. You know, there's still some fantastic flying schools here. There's some um, uh, old, old dogs who are not learning new tricks but passing on all the information as much as they can. I know Scully Levine does virtual training online. Now, Scully, he gave up commercial flying I think it was about a year or two ago, but still heavily involved in the air show world and training pilots and teaching pilots and inspiring young pilots. So that's what I'm hoping to do because, you know, people like my father-in-law, Scully Levine, Dennis Spence, the older generation are at some stage going to move on. They're not going to have their licenses anymore. And another good friend of mine has inspired me to, you know, become one of the next generation that inspires our up-and-coming pilots here in South Africa, but not only here in South Africa, I've got my affinity to Zimbabwe, where I was born and bred, so well connected with people in aviation there. And I just, yeah, I think if you have a passion for it, don't ever give up on your passion. That would be my message to anyone watching this or listening to this, is don't give up on your passion. There's always ways and there's always means of of reaching your dream, that's for sure. But do you get a lot of young um, uh, people coming into the industry? Uh, You know, because it is an expensive industry. And like you say, you... Uh, this uh, young man that you were uh, sponsoring, but not not everybody has that opportunity. So do you get a lot of interest? Um, I, I believe we do, yes. Uh, there, are, there are people fortunate enough who do get sponsorship, whether it's from a company, an airline, uh, banks, you know, parents. I've heard of parents remortgaging their house just so their child can get their pilot's license. A lot of people might think, well, why are you getting into the industry? I think this is the time. Personally, the amount of information I've been reading over the last six, seven months about pilot shortages, et cetera, et cetera, why wouldn't you get into the industry at this stage? Unfortunately, aviation and pilots as professionals have taken a big hit. I look at the way pilots were paid in the 80s at Cathay Pacific, and I look at the package I joined on. Now, you couldn't compare them, but again, supply and demand. So, you know, the traveling public wants to travel now. People have been locked up for a couple of years. People want to go and see family and friends and and maybe tick off something on your bucket list like I managed to do a few, few weeks ago in the UK. So why not, if you've got the passion and you want to be a pilot, why not find a way? And there are ways, you know, there are definitely ways. I don't know them all, but... I'm sure if you sit down and you network and you speak to the right people and who knows, maybe an uncle could sponsor you, maybe a bank, you could get a loan. You, know, you never know. There are ways. There are ways and means. I mean, when I wanted to fly at six, 17, 16, 17, I think my father could have maybe afforded one or two hours a month if I was lucky. That wouldn't have got me too far. But yeah. there was people at the Mashon Land Flying Club who were willing to help me and say, okay, we'll work at the club and do X, Y, and Z, and you know, we'll pay for your flight. So there are definitely ways. Uh, I was now so thinking of what you were saying. Lost your train of thought. Got what I wanted to ask. No, because it's very, it's, it's really inspiring to think that, um, you know, in a country in South Africa where where the economy is also not that great, you know, that you say that you say that there's now is the time. Now is the time to to do something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's also expensive to own your own plane. So this is also then again a new uh, obstacle that you have to overcome. Definitely. I mean, I've got friends who own airplanes, and you know, they say the cheap part is actually buying the plane. It's the insurance, the hangar, it's mm-hmm. the maintenance, et cetera, that's the cost. Uh, Look, aviation is not cheap. Um, The way I look at it though is you will get a return on your investment. There are some students at the flying school that I I work at here at Grand Central, you know, their parents have been wise and said, okay, well get a degree. And then if you still want to fly, we'll pay for your flying. Now, lucky they've got parents who can help them get a degree as a backup. You know, I look at it in the sense that I don't have matric. My mm-hmm. co-pilot who flies the jet with me doesn't have the trick. Mm-hmm. We just had a passion and a drive and some way of finding people to help us. And there are a lot of people out there who are willing to help. You know, whether it's 
a sponsorship from a government organization, whether it's a sponsorship mm-hmm. from an airline even. I see Qatar Airways is advertising for, it says a self-paid sponsorship. I'm not quite sure how that works, to be honest. Yeah. But, you know, there are airlines who are looking to assist mm-hmm. youngsters who want to get back or get into aviation, I should say. Mm-hmm. So what do you now do? Uh, do you have your own airline or, or your, your no. own? Um, I fly a corporate jet based at Lanseria here in Johannesburg. Uh, I've been with the company exactly three years now. In fact, this time three years ago, I was in the USA. Really? Uh, getting this airplane that I fly now, I picked it up and I flew it back from the USA, which was yeah. uh, an amazing experience. I managed to... Because I have an American license, the plane was on the American register. I had experience on the Learjet 60 and the company I joined wanted me to do the ferry flight. So they knew as soon as I got it back here, what the problems were, what worked, what didn't work, and they had a history of the plane. So that's one of the reasons I was selected to do the, the ferry flight. I was very fortunate to fly with a, an American guy who was married to a South African. I mean, what are the odds in the whole of America? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to find a pilot who's married to a South African. So him and I got really, we got on really well. We had a fantastic uh, ferry back from Tucson um, through Iceland, Ireland, down the West African coast and then back to South Africa. So Amazing. Um, well, I, I can just say if he's married to a South African woman, he's a brave man. <laughs> <laughs> and she's also a pilot. She's a helicopter pilot. So. Oh, really? Um, yeah, they have an amazing relationship. They're such a great couple. So, oh. I'm very yeah, I, so I fly privately. It's for a private company. They're based here in Midrand. They have a couple of aeroplanes and a helicopter. So I'm the captain on the, the Learjet 60. They also have a Global Express and, uh, and ask me the helicopter. I think it's a bell. Oh, I'm not even going to tell you. I can't remember. I don't know heli- helicopters. Uh, okay, but, but yeah. where do you fly people to now? So we mainly fly the directors and managers of our company, and mm-hmm. it's to take them on business trips, for argument's sake, Mozambique, Zambia, Angola, up to West mm-hmm. Africa, Central Africa, and back. We have taken the plane up to Europe before, uh, which was an amazing trip, you know, flying around yeah. Russia and the Ukraine, and uh, okay, very different in this day and age, but wow. you know, the Middle East, uh, mm-hmm. it was just fantastic. We had such a great trip and what a great experience, not only for me, but for my co-pilot. Mm-hmm. But now yeah. it's a, 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 how many times do you have to do a, a stop over and to refuel when you go, say, for instance, to Russia from South so Africa? Uh, our aircraft is, um, it's basically got an endurance of about five hours. So anything after four, four and a half hours, we're on, uh-huh. on the ground. But it was incorporated in a whole trip with the boss. So we took him up to West Africa. He did business there. Then we went up to uh, Tenerife to refuel. And then from Tenerife, we went up to the UK. <laughs> As wow. luck would have it, yeah. our airport was, was fogged in. So we had to hold and then diverted to Luton. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in my whole career, I think I've only diverted three times and that was one of them so uh, <laughs> uh, it gets you thinking a little bit and then from the uk we went across to russia and across to moscow so that's about a three and a half hour flight mm. yeah and how high do you fly with the jet so our aircraft is certified for fifty one thousand feet how they ever got it there i don't know we okay. mainly fly between thirty seven thousand feet and forty one thousand feet above sea level Wow. So, okay. So that's quite. Yeah. That's quite, it's quite high. high. Yeah. 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 It's up where the airline is flying, sometimes higher than the airline. Really, and um, uh, and when the traffic is because there's a lot of airlines flying. So, do you see them? I mean, do you? So, you know, that's the thing with, uh, as you said, you know, your holiday makers sit in the back of the airplane and they're going from position A to position B. Uh-huh. And I think they think that we sit there with our feet up sipping coffee and, you know, reading the newspaper and things like that. Yeah. Um, sometimes we do. I won't lie. <laughs> <laughs> Other times, yeah, we, we're talking on the radio. We're doing fuel checks. We're doing time monitoring to see that our estimates are correct. And, you know, we're looking out for other traffic. Uh-huh. I remember doing a flight. Sure. I think it was about 2018. We were doing a trip up to 
Luanda in the Lear 60 that I used to fly. And coming in the opposite direction, exactly a thousand feet above us was a Airbus 380. Now, if you fly through the wet turbulence of that, um, your chances of survival are slim. There was an aircraft in the Middle East that threw, excuse me, flew through the wake turbulence of the 380 and they ended up upside down. People were badly injured. Mm -hmm. you know, there was red wine all over the ceiling and food everywhere. And they managed to recover the plane and land it. The plane could never be flown again. So, really? You know, you have to be paying attention. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, we do have challenges in every job. And some of the challenges are air traffic control don't always give you the information you require. So, you mm -hmm. know, you do have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. But that one, we just did a 90 degree turn and flew, flew away from the oncoming traffic. Really? Yeah. And, uh, and, and the speed that you fly? We're flying roughly between about 75% to 80% the speed of sound. Okay. So it's, it's the same speed your, your airliners fly at. I suppose your 737s would fly at a similar speed. Not that mm -hmm. I've flown a 737. You know, your 777s and 380s, they're flying up between 80 and 85% mm -hmm. the speed of sound. Mm -hmm. So it varies on temperature and altitude and things like that. So it's not an exact figure that we always fly, but we're, we're averaging about 830 kilometers an hour, if I have oh, to put it in the yeah, so that's, yeah. Mm, that's quite so, fast, yeah. Yeah. But now, uh, yeah, and like you say, you have to think of all these things and it's it's not, and it's also the weather and the winds and, the, and all these things. So you have to really have all your senses almost active when you are there. So do you think flying is for everybody? Do you think somebody can be trained really to fly or does he have to have something, you know, that, that, uh, that makes him able to be aware of all these things and think about all these things? You know, Petra, that's a great question. Uh, flying is not for everybody. I could mm -hmm. bring in my wife now and she'll tell you no way. She hates flying. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, she has the any air problem. So, you know, mm -hmm. her in light aircraft especially, she suffers with turbulence and nausea and vomiting and things like that. Mm -hmm. I don't believe flying is for everybody. I believe most people are trainable. Mm -hmm. You know, I have witnessed in my career certain people, somehow they get a PPL, private pilot license. But unfortunately, there's a difference between the actual flying of an airplane and then what we call the human skills of flying. Mm -hmm. So that is one of my passions. I recently became recertified as a CRM instructor and CRM trainer, which means I can now teach young pilots, new pilots, old pilots in crew resource management. In other words, certain airlines, let's take Emirates, for example, they have nine core competencies of what they expect in a pilot, things like leadership, teamwork, communication, uh, situational awareness, amongst other things and they train their pilots on what's called evidence-based training so they see the mistakes that have happened over the last year and then they go okay what scenarios can we put together not to see if they can fly the plane or how they want to see the human side of it they want to see that you can communicate with your crew you can communicate with air traffic control you can work as a team you can lead your team you can follow your team so that's one of the things we're finding here now in South Africa is a lot of people can do this, you know, I can turn and I can pull back and I can push forward and I can pass my PPL. Unfortunately, what they do lack is decision-making, risk management, uh, working as a team, being a leader, communicating questions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's something this group that I've joined here in South Africa is working on is how can we teach the human side of aviation? Yeah, because if you are also, I think, in there up in the air in a situation, then you need the right person to be able to deal with it. Then you just uh, have to have that uh, mm -hmm. char character, you know, the, the, the leadership to, to um, handle it. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very... What's the word I'm looking for? Please keep your train of thought. Sorry, I don't want to, I feel I'm no, talking no, no, no. too much. <laughs> no, 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 I love it. I love it. Um, it's very interesting. Yeah, you know, if you look back on case studies in air crash investigations, et cetera, et cetera, the biggest, 
I suppose, turning point in aviation was the Tenerife accident where two 747s collided on the runway. Over 500 people were killed. And that came down to a very impatient captain who, his words were, it's my way or the highway, basically. We're going. Mm -hmm. And the engineer and the first officer didn't have an opportunity really to challenge him. So mm -hmm. there are other cases where captains have been domineering. There are cases where first officers have been, what's the word I'm looking for? They haven't spoken up. They haven't mm -hmm. spoken up. They've let the, basically let the captain fly them to their death. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we need to look at more and more in our industry. And it's nice to see a lot of the leading airlines going down this route of training. But as I discussed with a good friend of mine the other night on a phone call is we need to start implementing this at the base, at the ground level now with PPL students, et cetera. Yeah, so that you don't train them and then get to that point where you see this is not going to happen. Yeah. Mm. Oh, very much. No, that's true. But mm. now tell me about this other side that you're doing, this other, um, uh, the, what you told me about. The, 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the four years that I took off between leaving Cathay, and a lot of people might ask, well, why would you leave Cathay? <laughs> mm -hmm. At the time, it felt like the right thing. Um, I was tired of being tired. You know, this is a thing that I never understood as a youngster. I wanted to fly and I loved airplanes and I loved being up in the sky. But a lot of the time as pilots were managing boredom. Mm -hmm. So I was tired of being tired and I thought I need a change in my life. And I wanted to go down the route of understanding more about human behavior, human performance. I also wanted to go down the route of helping people and that's why I got into life coaching and, and public speaking and things like that mm -hmm. helping people just to find their passion find their purpose now I thought for a long time oh, I don't know what my purpose is I'm tired of this and I've been for this course and I've been for that course and I read this book and I'm getting nowhere until mm -hmm. someone said to me you were born to be a pilot go back to flying and make your passion into something at the time I had no idea what Fortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I'm understanding that I really want to help people with that, as I said, the human skills in aviation, or some people refer to it as the soft skills. That's my passion. If I can help one young pilot learn to make a decision that one day not only saves his life, but saves the lives of, say, 300 people behind him on an airplane, happy days, you know? If you look at... Um, that Sully movie with Tom Hanks, you know, the one that they landed on the Hudson. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw yeah. that. Yeah. So if you watch that movie, when he's learning to fly, I think his instructor, you know, just tells him, stick and rudder and enjoy yourself and always fly the airplane. Mm -hmm. Never stop flying the plane. And that's exactly what Sully did until he landed on the Hudson. He carried on flying that airplane. So... Mm -hmm. There's a great instructor who passed on a little bit of advice one afternoon and saved the life of, I don't know how many people it was, over a hundred and something people. Yeah. So. You, you give me goosebumps now. <laughs> but, that's, but that's true. That's true. You know, you never know what you say or, or how you teach, what impact will it have and how that person, uh, on the other hand, in, takes it up and understands mm -hmm. it, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. But now uh, tell me, now I want to know, what is it about aviation now that you love? So this is another thing I always thought about is why aviation? Because, yeah. okay, you can see my memorabilia behind me and what yeah. have you. But I, I'm not one of those guys who, if I'm not flying, I'm flying a remote control airplane or if I'm not flying a remote control airplane, I'm, teaching uh, someone in aviation or I'm reading books on aviation. I'm not, I'm not one of those aviators. There, there's guys out there. My father-in-law is one of them. I've got a few friends who are similar to that. And I take my hat off to them. Mm. I love aviation for the fact that every single day I go to work, there's a new challenge, a different challenge. And what can I learn from it? At times, it's very difficult because you think, Really, I just want to get in the plane today, fly from A to B, get off, go to the hotel, have a nice dinner, sleep. Tomorrow we fly back. 
and it never happens that way. So aviation for me is a lot about learning about myself. And, you know, if I learn enough about myself and I can pass that on to future generations and hopefully, you know, changes, changes the way they fly an aeroplane or look at their aviation career possibly. Yeah. But now this is almost uh, the, the two questions in one that you answered because I want to know what your wishes are for the future now. That's a great question. Um, I have always been one of those who likes to control my life. You know, my mm -hmm. life needs to be in control. But what I've realized is I'm starting to let life flow. In other words, things will happen when they're meant to happen. And the more you try and push something, the more you're pushing it away rather than letting it come to you, if that makes sense. Yeah. So right now, I just, you know, I'm going to get my instructor rating hopefully by the end of the month, if not the beginning of next month. Um, I'm going to start running these CRM courses for instructors because I believe our instructors are the ones who are going to pass on the information to the base of aviation, your PPL students and that. And if they have a solid grounding in the human skills and the human factors side of aviation, then possibly that will help them instruct in a different way. Possibly it will help them inspire the next generation who will, you know, as one thing yeah. leads to another, inspire the next generation. So my wishes right now is just to give of my best and I suppose give of my best back to the industry. I'm very fortunate in the people who've helped me and now it's time to pay it forward as such. <laughs> That's yeah. how I look at it, yeah. Yeah. And how long do you still hope to fly? Oh, Petra, you know what? As long as I can pass a medical... Uh, I hope I can. Yeah, I'm only 50 now. They've just increased the retirement age, I think, to 68. Yeah. So, you know, another 18 years. It just, you know, if you don't have anything to get up for in the morning, what's the point? Yeah, yeah. You know? but, and that's what my dad said. He said if he gets up in the morning and he doesn't, he, he's not looking forward to doing this job this day, then he'll retire. And he's 85 this year and he still works. Wow, that's phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, I saw you interviewed uh, Tony Schmidt. Um, uh, yeah, I was, yeah. Yeah, so Tony is very good friends with my father-in-law. Tony did my uh, ATP flight test here in South Africa. Yeah. And he's an inspiration because, you know, there he is. I think he's also 85 and still yeah. giving it his, his best and, and doing what he can. So, mm. you know, why not? Why not? Yeah. Yeah, and he's doing this wonderful, he's part of this wonderful restoration project in uh, the uh, um, uh, Spitfire, yes, right. uh, which is so amazing that, you know, his passion for for leaving that behind, you know, I think for, for the history and, and for the next generation to know this and to understand this, this is uh, amazing that he does that. Yeah, sure. and it's a wonderful plane. I was very fortunate, as I said, I ticked off one of my bucket list items a few weeks ago in the UK and went for a flight in a Spitfire. So, really, did uh, you? Yeah, um, amazing, I'm still excited by it. And I was fortunate to fly with one of the leading display pilots in the UK, um, mm -hmm. a lady called Anna Walker, who I'd watched a few days earlier at an air show and was just sat there with my mouth open, seeing what this lady could do in an aeroplane. So yeah, uh, you know, I take my hat off to Tony. I haven't got a clue. I'm not good with, you know, DIY and things like that, mm -hmm. much to my wife's disgust. <laughs> I'd rather, as they say, I'd rather pay a man, come and do the job. Um, you know, get that fixed, do that, put that picture up, do this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, to restore an aircraft and, as you say, keep keep the history alive and yeah. possibly the next generation. What a wonderful, wonderful thing Tony's doing at the end of the day. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. So one of my other passions is ultra marathon walking and ultra marathon running. Really? Yeah. So um, we've just Are recently. You an athlete? I'm not an athlete. No, I just I don't know. I just love challenges because for me it's a challenge mm -hmm. of the life. So mm -hmm. we were supposed to be going to Big Falls next week to do this 24-hour fundraising walk. Unfortunately, with Kome going into business rescue, we've had to cancel the or postpone our trip. So. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, just getting involved in the walk has got me involved with other people who, I mean, there's a guy 
He's going to walk around the Lake Kariba. I don't know if you know much about Lake Kariba. No. So Lake Kariba is the biggest man-made lake in Africa, and he's going to walk around the shoreline of Africa of Lake Kariba in two months. Oh, it's take him wow. two months to walk around. So yeah. <laughs> if you say twenty-four hour walk, so you walk literally for twenty-four hours. Yeah. So it's, with no it's, stop. No stop. It's to raise money for the Victoria Falls Wildlife Trust. So. We were going to do that on the 14th because it's a full moon, but we'll, we've had to postpone it. So we'll look at probably doing it in August. If not, we'll have to do it next year. Okay. So I'll have to and keep training. <laughs> yeah, and how many people do this walk? Uh, it's just going to be myself and a friend of mine. He is the one who talked me into it. Um, okay. And, you know, you do have support from the people who work for the Wildlife Trust and that. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so you yeah. say you run as well, you do long distance running. So, I've done two oceans a couple of times, and uh, I've done other fundraising walks and fundraising runs. So, you know, if you're doing it for a purpose, I think it has more meaning. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, anyway. yeah. And how involved are you still in Zimbabwe? Um, I'm trying to promote our walk as well as Nick Home is the gentleman who's going to be walking around Kariba. I'm trying to promote that in the sense that Nick's walk is involved with conservation and mental health. And mm -hmm. as you know, at the moment, there's a lot of mental health issues around the world. Yeah. And I recently in December lost a friend of mine who committed suicide, but unfortunately wow. mental health issues that no one picked up. So that is something that has become quite close to my heart. So if we can't do the walk for the Wildlife Trust, then we will do the a couple of days walking with Nick around the shores of Kariba. And okay. he will be doing videos and promoting stuff because apparently the suicide rate is quite high in Zimbabwe at the moment. Mm -hmm. So he set up a foundation to help people who need help. In other words, somewhere to go, someone to speak to, uh, you know, possibly someone to even just give you some food and for one of a better word, a shoulder to cry on to help you not take your own life. So, yeah. Um, and they found with a lot of research at the moment that mental health can be helped a lot with using animals and nature, etc. It's a new, a new thing that doctors and scientists are looking into, but there's a gentleman in Zimbabwe who's getting great results with rehab with drug and alcohol just by using nature and orphaned animals. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, I think animals, we, we underestimate the power of, you yes. know, what the animals yes. do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. you can also, I think in old age homes, they found that when there's a, when there are pets, that the, that the um, people are also more active and more positive and so on. So, yeah. I think yeah. this is great. But Nick, now tell me just one more thing. Um, sure. What um, can you do a shout out for your favorite restaurant or coffee shop in the area? Wow. In the area, yeah, sure. So my wife and I go to Jackson's at Kailami One. Um, we go there at least twice a week. And mm. then there's another restaurant we actually go every Monday for breakfast, a place called Streetery, which is at uh, Kailami. Ridge, I think it is just opposite the Mall of Africa. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll, so I'll, those are, I'm a coffee snob, as is my wife. So, you know, yeah. we go where the coffee is good. And I have to say, both places, the food is good. So, okay. you know, we're quite um, blessed. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll put the I'll put the link in the description, definitely. Super. Yeah. yeah. So, are you, are you, um, where are you based? In Pretoria? Um, no, we live in Midrand, just by Kyle Army okay. Racetrack. And oh. uh, it's very handy because it's half an hour to Lens area. It's half an hour to uh, our Tambo. It's five, 10 minutes to Grand Central. So all the airports I need to be at, it's it's within, okay. yeah. you know, it's in the center of, it's halfway between everything, put it that way. Yeah. So it's very handy for us. And yeah, love it, Jim. Mm. If you, if, if, because you fly so fast, do you drive fast as well? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, the jet we fly, we're very fortunate. It's still got one of the highest power to weight ratios on any corporate jet. Mm. And as one of our colleagues put on Facebook the other day, if you're not respectful of the airplane, it will bite you. But um. when it comes to driving, no, I... I'm very fortunate I have a discovery tag on my windscreens. I have to keep to speed limits and 
watch my breaking and watch my cornering. So then I get my points back from discovery, which means, you know, I pay for half my fuel. And, you know, uh, you know the price of fuel in South Africa at the moment is very high. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I heard. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, okay. I'm not a speed <laughs> freak, definitely not. No. <laughs> so, you're a good boy. <laughs> I try to be. I think I've weighed up the risks. Um, my brother loves his racing. My brother used to race go karts. Yeah. And yeah, he loves speed and things like that. But no, I'd rather uh, just, okay. I'll stick to the 80Ks an hour or the 120, depending on the road I'm on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, this was so lovely to talk to you and so Thank inspiring, you, really. Likewise. But uh, come, come fly to Vienna. <laughs> well, I'm hoping we do sometime, you know. You never know. It's yeah. the one day we're here, the next day we're there. And then, you know, we went to Pemba one night for literally one night and we came back two weeks later. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, will you let um, me know when you're in Vienna? I uh, will do. I'll, I'll keep in contact with you. Thank you, Petra. Thanks for yeah. having me on your channel. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I would so love to meet you in person. Likewise, likewise. Yeah. And if you're ever in South Africa, you know where we are. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, I'll, I'll definitely um, let you know when I'm there. Super, super. Okay. Thanks, Petra. Okay, Nick. Have, have a, a wonderful lovely day. Afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Take care. There's a, Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.